thank you, Darren, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm really pleased um, to have an opportunity to present um, this research, which I've been working on um, for um, over a year now with uh, my colleague Ona Sullivan from, from Trinity College Dublin and Dr. Anna, Anna Visser from the Department of Children, Disability Integration and Youth, who is speaking today in a personal capacity. Um, so as the um, title of the presentation uh, explains, the paper looks at the politics of traveller housing and accommodation provision in Ireland um, since 1960, which is the period in which the, the state first got involved. All three of us are going to attempt to present, which might be a, a tad ambitious, we'll see, we'll see what it'll work out. And we, we also have some videos in, embedded in our presentation, which we, we hope will work. And if not, please, please bear with us. So, so just to start, I, I thought it would be useful to clarify to people who aren't familiar with the Irish traveller community, um, just to give you a few statistics about the size of the population and the proportion of the, of the population they make up. So this is really a very small um, proportion of the Irish population. The last census recorded uh, just under 31,000 residents of the Republic of Ireland who identified as white Irish traveller. And according to the census, they account for just 0.7% of the population of the Republic of Ireland. However, despite the small size of the population, traveller housing and other forms of accommodation for travellers has proved to be one of the most intractable, knotty and contentious policy challenges of the last century in Ireland. And this has been consistent right back since the state first started to get involved in providing services to and also regulating the lives of travellers back in the 1960s. So the first um, major state policy document on travellers was the Commission on Itinerancy report, which reported in 1963. Um, there was some council housing pro provided for travellers prior to this, but it was really from the 1960s that the state started to get involved in providing services for and regulating the lives of travellers in a concerted way. And over that period, there's been four major reports um, or commissions of investigation into um, the accommodation of travellers and also other issues um, such as education and health. And they've reported in 1963, 1983, 1995, and an expert group on traveller accommodation of which I was a member um, reported last year. So there's been quite a lot of policy attention to travellers and traveller accommodation. But despite this, it, it's quite striking that the levels of inadequate accommodation amongst travellers have remained intractably high since government first started to address this issue in the 1960s. So you can see from the slide there that when the Commission on Itinerancy started work in 1960, it reported that 1,133 traveller families were living in what they call unauthorised encampments, generally on the side of the road or on in waste ground. And I should mention, data on traveller accommodation is always for families which are largely equivalent to households, but not always. So, so these data are on, are on families. So there was 1,133 um, traveller families living on the side of the road in 1960. But by the time the next government investigation into traveller accommodation, the Travelling People Review Body, reported in 1983, 1,442 travellers were similarly accommodated on the side of the road. And this situation hadn't changed substantially by 1995, when the next major um, commission, the Task Force and the Travelling Community, reported. So by then, there was also just over 1,000, 1,112 traveller families on the side of the road. So most recently, when the expert group um, of which I was a member, uh, examined the issue. Um, the level of inadequate accommodation among travellers um, had remained very, um, very high, um, but the, the particular manifestation of, of inadequate accommodation has changed. Um, so by 
um, 2020, last year, the number of traveller families in unauthorised encampments had fallen to 529. Um, so, so that had reduced, but there was a large increase in the number of families involuntarily sharing accommodation on government provided halting sites, etc. So the numbers in that category had in increased to 933. And also there's a very significant problem of um, homelessness among traveller families, particularly in the Dublin area, um, where traveller families make up a large minority of families in homeless accommodation and have huge issues in terms of leaving homeless accommodation um, and moving out and securing housing, particularly in the private rented sector. So, so over this period, the, the problem of inadequate accommodation among travellers has remained intractably high. And it's, it's worth um, explaining that this level of inadequacy in accommodation provision has quite significant negative implications for the, uh, for the uh, population. So particularly manifested in severe public health inequalities. So mortality rates among travellers are 3.5 times higher um, than the settled Irish population, the, the majority population in other words, Infant mortality rates among travellers are 3.6 times higher, and traveller life expectancy is 15 years lower for men and 11 years lower for women. Um, so accommodation is extremely significant in a, in a whole range of respects, but particularly in that fundamental respect in, in terms of public health. So why has the provision of sufficient um, accommodation for travellers proved such an intractable policy challenge over this long period? So this is partially due to a marked expansion in the size of the traveller population since the 1960s. So I mentioned that travellers um, are a very tiny proportion of, of the Irish population at large. But over the period of these, these four commissions of investigation into traveller accommodation, the population, uh, the traveller population has increased by about tenfold so since 1960. Um, so the, the, the goalposts are moving then in, in terms of the level of accommodation um, to be provided. But it, it's also due to very severe problems in the implementation of policy on the traveller community. Um, which I um, investigated a number of years ago in some research work I conducted with my colleague, Dr. Nessa Winston from UCD School of Social Policy, Social Work and Social Justice. And we identified a very marked implementation deficit. In other words, a difference between the objectives of policymakers and what was being delivered on the ground. Um, so this is a strong but, but also complex because we found that the volume of accommodation provision um, is high but inconsistently inadequate compared to need. Um, but interestingly, the type of accommodation pro provided was often at variance to what policymakers envisaged. So as we'll go on to discuss um, in terms of accommodation for travellers, because of very low incomes, the vast majority of it is social housing provided mainly by local authorities or councils. So different commissions of investigation have, have emphasised that different types of accommodation are particularly appropriate for travellers. So some of them have emphasised um, the need to encourage travellers to move into standard housing, which in, in practice is council housing. Others have emphasized the importance of making accommodation available, which facilitates traveler culture and identity, and particular nomadism, traveling, which is central to traveler culture, and also extended family living. And this is generally done by providing halting sites and group housing schemes. And in that early research I, I carried out with Nessa Winston, we identified an interesting trend whereby um, the type of accommodation in terms of standard housing versus um, uh, traveller specific accommodation that was actually delivered was often at variance with what was recommended by policy makers. So this implementation deficit is very interesting and this is why Owen and Anna and I have decided to return to this issue and do further analysis on it. Um, because the usual explanations that policy analysts would put forward for problems in implementation don't really apply to travellers. So policy on traveller accommodation is supported by a 
very robust um, evidence base compared to other forms of housing policy. Um, so there's been enormous amounts of research conducted on travellers. There's an annual count of traveller families conducted by local authorities. There's annual reporting into a central government agency. There's, there's detailed monitoring of spending. So the evidence base is actually very strong. And policy on the area has been specified in quite a lot of detail. Um, and the detailed uh, nature policy has become more detailed over time. So if you look at the, the more recent commissions of investigation, the task force and the expert group report, um, they go into enormous detail in terms of the type of accommodation required and the mechanisms for delivering it. So it isn't an issue that there are problems in terms of policy specifications. And also funding for traveller accommodation is relatively generous compared to other forms of social housing. Um, so 100% of traveller accommodation delivery costs are funded by central government. So central government normally funds between 60 and 80% of general council housing delivery um, costs and the rest is funded by local authorities own income. Um, so um, for travellers, that's not the case. 100% is centrally government funded. And indeed, there's been a significant problem of failure to draw down um, the funding that's been made available. Um, so the usual explanations for um, policy implementation deficits don't apply in the case of traveller accommodation. So in this paper, we return to this issue of the implementation deficit regarding traveller accommodation provision and the kind of complex and changing and unusual nature of the deficit. And as the title of the paper implies, in order to um, uh, shed light on the reasons for this implementation deficit, um, we focus on the other defining feature of the debate on accommodation um, and housing for travellers, and that is its contentiousness. So um, there's been a very, very long history of conflict with communities in different parts of the country um, where traveller accom accommodation for travellers is proposed and also with um, residents of local authority estates, council housing estates, where it's been proposed to house travellers. And in this regard, traveller accommodation is, is probably uniquely contentious in history of Irish social policy, uniquely contentious in terms of the, the level of conflict around it and how widespread conflict is in urban and, and rural areas. And as I mentioned, um, nomadism and also extended family living are central to traveller culture and traveller activists have placed increased emphasis on in recent decades on the importance of these features to their cultural identity and therefore um, they argue for traveller human rights. So a lot of the conflict has been around access to traveller specific accommodation, as I mentioned, um, halting sites for traveller caravans, but also group housing schemes, which are small housing estates for extended tra traveller families. So there's been conflict around providing this form of accommodation, which supports traveller culture, traveller activists would argue it does, compared to mainstream council housing. And one of the reasons why this has been central to the, a, the um, conflict around traveller accommodation is that um, it's central to wider debates about the assimilation of travellers into the majority settled population. So the assimilation of travellers into the culture of the majority population who are sedentary and live in permanent houses and a debate around the recognition of travellers distinct nomadic ethnic identity on the other hand. So to explore these issues in the paper, we apply a framework which was proposed by Matland in 1995 um, called the ambiguity conflict model of policy implementation. So just before I hand over to Owen, I'm going to just explain to you briefly what the ambiguity conflict model of policy implementation is. So Matland's Matland argues that almost all policies are characterized by some element of conflict. Some policies are characterized by higher levels of conflict and traveler accommodation is um, one of them. And as a kind of a mechanism for coping with 
conflict around the objectives or the implementation of policies. Policymakers often build in a certain amount of ambiguity in their design of policies. So it can be amb ambiguity um, in terms of policy objectives are, aren't clear. So, you know, um, opponents of the policy find it very hard to latch on to specific issues they can object to. But there can also be what Maclan calls ambiguity of means. So in other words, the mechanism for implementing the policy can be ambiguous and unclear. And this is a particular issue in traveler accommodation. So you can see that um, here from, from the graphic that Matlin suggests that the outcomes of um, policy can be predicted by the combination of ambiguity and conflict um, that can be seen in that particular policy. So in cases where ambiguity is low, the policy is clearly specified and conflict is low, you have administrative impl implementation, which means it's really just a matter of managing the implementation successfully. And if there's adequate resources, the, um, the uh, um, policy will be implemented successfully. In cases where conflict is low and ambiguity is high, you can have experimental impl implementation. Um, so again, local actors and resources will determine what happens and it may vary from place to place. Now, as I mentioned, traveler accommodation is associated with very high levels of conflict. And Matlan suggests that this can result in, in, in two different outcomes. So where there's high conflict and low ambiguity, um, you need political implementation to achieve implementation. So in other words, you need um, policymakers or politicians to effectively force through implementation and ensure it happens. Where policy um, conflict is high, and policy ambiguity is high, which is what we argue um, is characterizes traveler accommodation policy, you, you often get symbolic implementation. So in other words, unless there's a very strong coalition of supporters for the implementation of a policy, you find that the policy is written, but it's never implemented in practice. So the policy is entirely symbolic. So I'm going to hand over to my, my colleague, Ona Sullivan now, who's going to continue with the presentation. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so in this part, Dave, we just want to talk through the, um, the emergence of traveler issues uh, as a public policy concern. <clears throat> and probably one of the most um, convincing explanations is that put forward by Eva Brannock in her book, Becoming Conspicuous. Um, who describes the process in a number of parts of the country where the traveling community who had uh, existed largely in rural Ireland, um, but wintered largely in, in kind of the inner cities of, of Dublin and Cork, Limerick in particular, um, became more conspicuous as the process of uh, urban redevelopment in those cities um, pushed both travelers and other marginal households away from those inner city poor quality housing, um, and quite often to the margins of the outskirts of these cities, often in the same sites where local authorities were now developing uh, local authority housing. Um, so part of our argument is that travellers simply became more conspicuous, more visible um, during this period from the, the 40s onwards. Um, and, and that resulted in them becoming more problematic uh, as travellers migrated from the, the countryside as their the rural economy that had supported their economic activities um, gradually disappeared. Um, uh, and an increasing number of travellers then moved to the urban fringes, um, where they were now clashing with other marginal groups who were trying to secure um, local authority housing. Uh, and, and in a very interesting analysis uh, done of the number of parliamentary questions from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, the, the, the PQ shifted from a concern by farmers about um, uh, travellers trespassing in land, etc., to PQs now coming from urban TDs. Um, that, and that was kind of an, an interesting indication of, of that broad-based shift uh, of, of the traveller community from uh, the, the rural parts of the country to, uh, to the outskirts of, of um, urban Ireland. And, and that's largely what led to the 
uh, establishment of the Commission on Itinerancy, which eventually reported in 1963. It, it was this increasing concern where they now became subjects of policy um, interventions. Um, and, and the Commission on Itinerancy is a very thoughtful document. I think sometimes um, a, a series of probably um, a, a quotes from it that take out of context are used to describe the entirety of the report. It's actually quite a detailed and, and thoughtful report. But, but, but it started that process um, of trying to think through how best to respond um, to uh, the, the accommodation needs, particularly of the traveling community. And you can see on the slide here, the picture here, <coughs> this is Labray Park, which was the um, second ever uh, traveler specific site established. The first one was in Radkeel in Limerick. Uh, this is the second one in, in Dublin in Labray Park in Ballyfermot. Um, a particularly unsuitable site, um, and to this day is remains an unsuitable site. Um, and uh, of course, Saint Labre was the patron saint of beggars and homeless people. So um, I suspect it's probably somebody well-meaning who gave the title Saint Labre Park um, uh, to the, the this first site in Dublin. Um, Michelle, if you can move on to the the next slides, can I do it? Don't think I can move it, can I? Oh, sorry. I'll um, again. There, thanks, Michelle. And, and by and large, <clears throat> the, the policy from the Commission on Itinerancy well, was about assimilating travellers. They, they saw Irish travellers based on, albeit a very partial historical reading of the, the origins of the travelling community as kind of unsettled uh, settled people that had generally, as a result of the um, the consequences of the Great Famine um, had become dislodged from the land and took on board this um, nomadic lifestyle in order to uh, survive economically. So they, they saw their, this nomadic lifestyle as a quite a short term, it, it was relatively recent in origin, um, and that the response to the needs of the traveller community was to re-assimilate them back into the, the settled community. Um, and that was largely to be achieved through the provision of standard housing. In, in practice, as we saw on the last slide, there were um, quite a number of traveller specific sites, mainly halting sites, established mainly in Dublin because there wasn't sufficient stock of local authority housing to assimilate all travellers, um, but, but also in a number of other areas where th they felt that travellers would need this kind of, uh, a, kind of a, a step on the way to becoming uh, fully assimilated into uh, local authority housing that they would need kind of a trial period in a halting site and then they would move on to local authority housing. Uh, so hence you had both the provision of local authority standard housing and, and the provision of sites depending on both the uh, availability uh, in different areas but, but, but also that travellers would learn to become settled. Um, by the 1980s, the, 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 the report in 1983 adopted quite a different tone, much greater respect for traveller culture, um, and most importantly, facilitating traveller choice. Uh, that really, it was a matter for travellers to determine whether they wanted uh, standard local authority housing or group housing or um, uh, halting sites. It was also a period from the 70s onwards where there was quite an intense debate about traveller origins, because, because a lot of this issue around nomadism, ethnic identity, uh, and hence the type of accommodation that was appropriate to be provided was based on this idea of travellers as a separate ethnic identity. And it was probably the Sharon Bond Gemelsch and George Gemelsch, two American anthropologists who worked in Dublin in the 19, early 1970s, really were the first people uh, to very clearly identify the travelling community as a distinct ethnic group. Um, albeit much like the Commission Itinerancy was based on very uh, slim historical uh, work. Um, and, and over the next decade or so, both historians who, who kind of said, look, we find it difficult where it's not that we're unsympathetic, but th there isn't an archive of material that we can draw on to support the argument that travellers are a distinct ethnic group. Um, and Sinead Nishunair, another anthropologist, and, and a number of quite interesting debates, I, I think largely still unresolved, but, but, but from the purpose of policymaking, um, the in 2017 travelers were granted the recognition of, of traveler ethnicity 
by the time it's by the things of the time of Kelly. So in one sense, the, the historical and or the debates between uh, various social scientists and historians became irrelevant. From a public policy point of view, travelers were given uh, this uh, identity. Uh, and and th that, that campaign had been ongoing for a long time, but it also placed much greater emphasis on the provision of traveler specific accommodation and multiculturalism. So within the traveling community, uh, certainly the, the issue that travelers were a distinct ethnic identifier, a, a distinct ethnic group, certainly took hold from the 70, late 70s onwards. Uh, and for tra traveler activists, uh, that was largely then pushing the type of accommodation uh, that was deemed appropriate. And you can see there on the right hand side, just a brief summary of some of the key um, milestones to the point when we get to the uh, the most recent uh, review, that is the expert group on travel accommodation that as Michelle mentioned, uh, she was a member of. Um, and as we mentioned at the beginning, um, firstly, in overall terms, the number of travelers being accommodated by the state, uh, by local authorities particularly, has grown very significantly from virtually uh, a tiny number in standard local authority housing at the time of the Commission on Itinerancy uh, to over 4,000 families um, by 2019 now in uh, standard local authority housing. Um, also joined by approved housing bodies from the 80s onwards, um, but, but the number of those in local authority halting sites, as you can see, the grey line has uh, reached a peak in the around 2000, 2002, and has slowly fallen to about a thousand um, in, in the last year or two. And, and the point Michelle made at the beginning, it, what's interesting to look at is that the, um, the, the, the policy of the 70s, 60s and 70s about the provision of local authority housing also so appeared a very significant amount of uh, traveler specific accommodation being provided. The period of multiculturalism from 95 onwards, we see almost a decline in traveler specific and more uh, local authority housing um, or, or standard housing. So the accommodation type um, was at variance, we argue, with what policymakers and certainly the, the various expert groups and commissions and task forces had envisaged um, with, with local authority standard housing uh, dominating provision uh, over the, the, the entire period. Um, so, as we argue in the paper, that the, the, the goals of uh, assimilation have been replaced by multiculturalism, certainly at a, a high level, policy level, um, but policy goals have, have also become less ambiguous um, with very clearly specified targets, particularly from 1998 onwards with the Traveller Accommodation Act and the Traveller Accommodation programmes that local authorities need to adopt every five years. Um, so quite clearly specified targets for accommodation set out in policy statements, but we argue the means of implementation have remained largely unchanged and they are, and they remain ambiguous, uh, that the responsibility for the delivery of policy and delivery of accommodation remains the responsibility of local authorities. Um, and and that, that has proved problematic. Uh, and we will go through some examples of that in a while and why we think that that idea of symbolic implementation that Michelle mentioned in Matlin's model probably best describes uh, what has been going on over that period so that um, uh, high levels of um, very little, uh, very clear goals at a policy at a national level, but how we deliver on that has proved problematic. Uh, and a, a, probably a constant feature uh, of the uh, various reviews of travel accommodation have been the need to um, establish a national statutory body to remove that authority or that power a responsibility from local authorities to a centralized uh, body who would deliver uh, accommodation and, at a local level, um, but would not be constrained by the concerns of the conflicts by, within local authorities, elected members uh, and, and residents in, in uh, estates nearby. Um, however, in practice, <coughs> a number of different um, consultative national fora have been established but of all being advisory. Um, and the current manifestation is the National Traveller Accommodation Consultative Committee, which, uh, which I've chaired for the last eight years. So I have some uh, <laughs> insight into the, the purely advisory role that the um, uh, that, that forum has. Um, so I think we can move on, Michelle. I think we have just a couple of clips just to illustrate some of the, the difficulties. Um, so this is um, 
Tala bypass in the 1984. Because what we argue is one of the reasons for the lack of implementation at a local level is policy conflict. Opposition to traveler accommodation has remained uh, unfortunately high amongst the public. But we argue the focus of the conflict has probably changed or the opposition has changed from uh, local, from traveler families being provided with local authority housing um, to a concern uh, and conflict around the provision of uh, traveler halting sites and a shift from conflict in rural Ireland to conflict in um, uh, uh, urban Ireland. So I think that we have a video clip now from, um, this is Galway, uh, Bohor Moor in 1970 when uh, a traveler woman, Annie Fury, was accommodated. Sorry, Michelle, yeah, far away. So I'm going to play this from, from one minute in, but you can see the uh, rioting, uh, essentially rioting that preceded the video clip. And the clip is of an RTE report from this uh, house being allocated to Mrs. Fury Council House in, in Galway. The scene inside this house last night was grim as Mrs. Fury stood in her dark and bare front room, watching the crowds out here on the roadway. Often she had to seek shelter at the back of the house as stones were thrown through the window. People came and went to Fursey Road up to the early hours of this morning, jeering and shouting. When her furniture arrived by van at 9.45 last night, the crowd swelled and a number of stones were thrown. Gardy had to move in to help the RTE news crew, that's Alan Seavers, Gay O'Brien and myself, as, as we tried to move through the crowd. Several attempts were made to snatch or damage our equipment, and my microphone was grabbed and disappeared. By three o'clock this morning, the crowd dispersed, and Fursey Road was quiet again. I really didn't hear anything about the woman until recently. But, uh, I don't know what to think myself, really. I don't, I, I feel sorry for the woman in a way, you know. Do you think that this, this sort of thing will stop? Do you think people will stop gathering outside her door and shouting and so on? Well, I imagine it will eventually, you know. That the situation will I ease down? Well, of course, really, it's the cooperation that, that is really mostly to blame, I think. In my Amazing. opinion. Well, of course, there's a lot of people on the, on the list for housing for ages and ages, and there, there's some more people, more badly, badly off than her, as far as I hear. Have you any objection to Mrs. Fury moving into well, that house? It's not a question of an objection, but there was um, a statement nearly out of all being smashed to pieces last night. I didn't see a thing happen. I live next to the woman. You not saw nothing at all happen last night? Well, I wasn't out on the crowd, but there was no um, breakage of glasses or anything. You didn't see any windows being broken? Well, I wasn't there to see anything broken, but I see this morning there was nothing broken. You didn't notice any broken windows this morning? I didn't see what's in the front that you saw yourself there. Well, how was the one window that was broken? How do you feel know. about Mrs. Fury moving into the house? You don't want to make any comment? No. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I don't know. It's not fair to put her in, in with this. It's respectful people. For me, she's an entire Indian term. And you don't think she should be put in? I don't think so. No, I don't think she'd be she allowed. What effect do you think she'd have on the neighborhood? Well, I wouldn't tell no idea about that. I wouldn't know. We'll have to get the mess now. But the people throwing stones last night? That is unjustified. Throwing stones? Throwing stones. stones. It's oh, just stones. sheer vandalism. That we don't contend with. Other than that. But you do object to Mrs. Fury in, in the house? I... No comment. Thank you very much. I wouldn't like to say... No comment at all to me? No. Have you any objection to her yourself? I have, yes. Do you have any reason? Well, I wouldn't like to say no, like to stay, make a statement. No. You don't want to say what your reason is. Do you think she'd disimprove the area at all? Well, why didn't you put the rubber next to herself? She'll tell you all. Mrs. Fury, what was it like last night? Uh, it was very bad. <laughs> it was very bad. The banging of stones and everything all night. And much, before, much before five o'clock this morning, six o'clock this morning, went to, they went to bed here. And do you plan to stay here? Oh, yes, I'm going to stay in it. I have no place to go. Where am I going to go to? And what about your children? Yes, I'll have to take them out and throw them. I'll leave them, I'll leave them out in the back I won't, I'm not saying man in the back now, where they are, you know. I'll leave them in the hospital for a while, do you know? I'll take them out after a little while. Are you going to see them today? Well, I suppose I'll have to go out to see them today, you know. Do you think there's any hope that these people will stop throwing stones and so on? I don't know. 
Can I go in bed? I didn't know the class, but I, don't, I didn't give them any class rules. Yeah, what have they got against you? I don't know. So I couldn't tell you that. They don't want me at this age. They don't want me. Uh, so that was Annie Fury. She had eventually left Chantella and actually died in Birmingham in England in the early 1980s. Um, but even the, the commentary says, interesting, the, the man in the glasses talk about you couldn't have her in with respectable people. Um, this You probably can't read this very clearly. This is a letter from the National Archives around uh, the same time, 1970, uh, from the Tenants Association of Father Meehan Place, Monine in Castle Bar. Uh, this is to the uh, county manager. Say, sir, you'll agree that we've all been very patient so far regarding the Tinker family you are forcing on us and our families here. This is the second Tinker family to be settled in Monine against the express wishes of the tenants and ratepayers of this area. As you will know from the attitude of the large number of townspeople at the Urban Council meeting on Thursday, 29th of January 1970, we cannot and will not be responsible for individual or other group actions against this or any other Tinker in this area. It is now obvious that these people are not wanted in the town or here. We insist the social stigma which will attach to this area or to the area will affect our children in later life. And we ask you to consider us and our future before a tinker um, signed by the Residence Committee of the our Tenants Association of Father Meehan Place. And then if we move forward, this is 1986, in virtually the same area of Galway, literally across the road from Chantella. Uh, this is 1986, and um, um, an attack on, on a, a group of travellers um, who, who, who had been forced from their halting site and had found temporary refuge in Claremont, the site of Claremont Park in Galway. Children, and they didn't care whether they killed us or not, they had no mercy. As far as I'm concerned, there isn't a, there isn't a man or a woman among them. That was Friday morning last, but there was even more trouble in store for the five families when local residents began to demonstrate near the entrance to the site. Their intermittent pickets made it quite clear they wanted the families to leave. However, on Monday last, other residents of the Claremont estate expressed their opposition to the picket and demonstrated in favour of the travellers. And since then, the argument has raged. Let's see what you'll do, Mr Lord Mayor. Why don't you take these people from here and give them a stand in your area? We have too much here already. You have none. The one man who you see here demonstrating otherwise, I understand he has moved into a rented house here within the last few days. He is not one of those people who has a 30,000 mortgage or a 40,000 mortgage. He can move out next week if he likes. In fact, we wouldn't mind if he moved out next week. Until we, the people of Ireland, grasp this problem and face it fairly and squarely and each community takes its fair share of responsibility towards providing an end to this problem it'll never go away and they will always be discriminated against and i just think that it's about time that we did something about it the west side of the city has already taken three quarters of the itinerant population of galway we have done our share i think you would agree to that son well, that's true that there are a, a, a lot of um, itinerant caravans around this area, yes. Would you admit no, that we've no done our share here, more than our share? Well, I don't think you do your share by doing what you did the other night when a mob of 80 people Hold on now, sir. broke into that's the field and, 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 and attacked them. We did, not, we did not break into the field on Thursday night. And do you condemn we it, sir? Here, yes, I do condemn the action. I certainly do, that. and that's the reason why we are continuing to do a peaceful demonstration here. And immediately after that confrontation, the residents here who opposed the picketing undertook a two-day survey of the estate. It showed that the majority still favour the protest, but it's only a slight majority. 30 in favour, 27 against. I'm satisfied with what the survey has shown in that I think it is a more balanced view of what the residents of Claremont in general feel about the issue. Uh, the meeting that we held on Saturday night, which was held at very short notice, some people only got an hour, uh, showed that a majority of the attendants there did want to pick at the five travelling families. Uh, we felt that that wasn't uh, a balanced view in view of the fact that a load of people on Saturdays were away anyway. And 
the reason we undertook this survey is just go around from, to go around from house to house and find what people thought when there was when they had time to think about it and just give them an opportunity to tell us what they thought. But it still showed that a majority of people on this estate still want the, the travellers removed from down here. That's right. Uh, uh, it was, it, according to our survey, it's a fairly small majority at the moment. But almost a week later, one of the central and still unresolved issues is what exactly took place here on Thursday night last. Were the travellers assaulted or were they not? Eyewitnesses still disagree. There was no fighting. There was no tractors going around after pregnant women around fields and so on. That was all malicious. I don't know, I was looking for sympathy there or what it is. That did not happen. There were windows smashed. I know that much. Is that violence? I think it's violence. If, uh, if children and uh, people are intimidated in the middle of the night when it's dark, as it was at the time, uh, anything that frightens them uh, to me is violence. And they didn't care whether they killed us or not, they had no mercy. Back to you, Michelle, I think. Apologies. Um, so, uh, or is it me still? Mentioned, uh, um, patterns of traveler accommodation provision have changed um, in terms of the change from uh, large numbers of council house allocations to, to travellers uh, or small numbers of uh, council house travellers and higher levels of halting sites um, to, to lower levels of traveller specific accommodation output in, in recent years. Um, so Owen so, spoke about how the changing pattern of uh, conflict from the settled community has shaped um, these outcomes. And particularly conflict on the fringes of urban areas and between urban working class and low income communities and, and travellers, because um, a point around the conflict in Galway, which, which was mentioned by some of the protesters, is that most of the accommodation for travellers is going into lower income parts of the uh, community, into council housing, but also halting sites predominantly adjacent to council housing. And there has been a general pattern in urban Ireland of much, much lower levels of traveller accommodation provision in high income communities. So in addition to these issues in the Geary Institute working paper we've published on this, we also argued that patterns of accommodation output also reflect the advent of new mechanisms for operationalizing or implementing, achieving your opposition in practice. So one of the very significant developments in Ireland over the past 40 years is the um, strengthening of the planning system. So prior to the 1980s, there was an extremely weak and effectively no planning system in, in rural parts of the country. Um, but that had been strengthened through development planning and strict um, application of, of planning permissions. So that means that when in the 1960s, it was relatively straightforward for councils to build halting sites wherever they, they wanted to, um, effectively without a planning system. Now it's much more difficult. And there has been a growth of legal action against proposed halting sites, particularly in um, middle class and, and higher income areas. And also councillors play a very significant role as um, veto players. So because uh, to prevent halting site development, um, so because uh, local authorities can't apply to, for planning permission to themselves, they, they are the planning authority as well, there is a system of um, getting planning permission for uh, local authority uh, accommodation, including halting sites called Part 8 planning, uh, where the councillors have to initiate planning. It's a decision of, of council, of the elected members of the council, and then there's a public consultation process. And this has proven to be very um, difficult to operationalize and practice um, due to the public op um, opposition. And this is one of the key reasons why we see the decline in the numbers of halting sites, families accommodated in halting sites. So councillors regularly fail to give approval to buy new land for halting sites, which they're required to. They fail to initiate part eight planning. We found no instances of that being initiated in the past 20 years. And also in the development plans, plans that, that specify the uh, location of developments over the next 20 or the next five years in a local authority area, there's no um, provision made for um, uh, halting sites. Um, whereas the expert group report um, 
looked at the numbers of travellers securing social housing in both council housing and approved body housing now between 2006 and 2018. And it found that travellers proportionately secured more social housing than the settled population. So opposition to travellers securing social housing seems to have dissipated, but opposition to halting sites and particularly new halting site developments seems to have increased. And also opponents of new halting site developments have new avenues um, to, to, to block that type of development, particularly through the planning process that didn't exist in the 1960s. Then finally, uh, just some points of conclusion, um, we highlight a consistent but complex and evolving implementation deficit in traveller accommodation policy. There's been high levels of housing and accommodation for travellers provided by local authorities um, since the government first got involved in this area in the 1960s, but overall output's been consistently adequate and the specific type of accommodation provided often contrast objectives of national government. This is very significant implications for travellers' quality of life, in, including their health and life expectancy. And it's striking that it's occurred despite very strong funding and increasingly unambiguous national um, policy objectives. So just return to Matlin's framework, he calls this ambiguity of goals. So in terms of national policy goals, there's been very little ambiguity and uh, uh, increasing uh, clarity over the decades. But on the other hand, there's been very um, significant continuing ambiguity in terms of implementation mechanisms, what Matlan calls ambiguity of means. So local authorities have remained responsible for um, implementation of traveller accommodation policy, despite numerous proposals from the, the National Commissions of Investigation into Traveller Accommodation that they would lose this authority. So they, they're responsible for implementation, but they have no actual legal obligations to actually affect implementation in practice. Matland argues that ambiguity is a way of dealing with conflict. So there's conflict in all, in all policies and in areas where conflict's particularly high, um, policymakers often make uh, policy goals or policy implementation. Ambiguous, ambiguous as a way of dealing um, with this. So in the Irish case, it's meant that ambiguity of means has led to very little implementation in practice because local coalitions of support which support the implementation of traveller accommodation policy just simply haven't been strong enough to affect implementation. So as I mentioned at the start of the paper, Matlin calls this phenomenon symbolic implementation. So through the implementation hasn't been achieved in practice, it, it, the implementation is purely symbolic. So in the context of high policy conflict, as in which we have in Ireland and low policy ambiguity, Matlin suggests that political implementation, essentially forcing implementation through is the only way forward. And the unwillingness of successive Irish governments to do this suggests that as well as being a, a, an example of symbolic implementation, Traveller accommodation policy is an example of symbolic policy making. So national governments, particularly in recent decades, have been willing to concede re relatively radical by Irish standards, progressive national policy objectives um, in terms of um, recognising travellers' ethnic identity and supporting multiculturalist policy solutions. Um, but this has been symbolic in the sense that they do this safe in the knowledge that these policies are unlikely to actually be delivered on the ground in practice. So thank you very much.